thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Walid Ali Dean, and I'll be um, hosting this session for you today. I'm, um, uh, I'm the instructional design manager at the Center for Innovation in Teaching and Learning here at the American University of Georgia. Uh, this session is about flipping your classroom, okay? Don't worry, we're not gonna like physically like go and put the ceiling on the floor and the floor on the ceiling. This is how we, um, we are going, we are dis discussing a model of instruction. Um, um, this lecture is, uh, this uh, session is part of a new series we are starting today. It's called the Teaching and Learning Hour. And this is your space to engage in a discussion about teaching and learning at the American University of Georgia. Before we begin, okay, um, let's address some, some of the technical issues, like make sure that your speakers are not muted. If you like, um, even if you cannot hear me now, you can read on the screen, make sure that your speakers aren't muted. If you are speaking, please unmute your microphone. If you are not speaking, please keep your microphone muted. If you experience any issues, we don't have like technical support on hand, the only thing we can offer you is to log out and log back in. The session is um, being recorded and the recording will be shared afterwards. This uh, session also um, requires you to respond and engage with some of the activities. Um, I'm talking about my activities, okay, that I will be presenting. And um, uh, throughout the slides, you can see that my activity page is accessible through this URL. I would advise you now to grab your phone, okay, and go ahead and uh, navigate to this URL. It's bit.ly forward slash CITL underscore poll, okay? So better get ready. I'm also pleased to have with me today um, two of our um, distinct, uh, distinguished uh, lecturers and professors at AUS. Uh, we have Dr. Meher Bahloud and I have Dr. Mark Aviard. Uh, Dr. Meher Bahloul is a, uh, a, an associate professor of language at the College of Arts and Sciences in the Department of English. Um, he is teaching language and linguistics, uh, teaching English as a second language, and also teaching com communications. Dr. Maher Bahu, um research areas covers theoretical and applied linguistic teaching and learning uh, and linguistics for language teachers, teaching English to Arabic speaking <laughs> students and Arabic uh, dialectology and Arabic pragmatics. Uh, Dr. Maher has a PhD in theoretical linguistics from Cornell University and his uh, he is a member of a number of international um, organizations, including the International Center for Innovation and Education uh, and the uh, European Teacher Education Network and uh, TESOL Finance Teaching English to speakers of other languages. We also have Dr. Uh, Mark Aviard, he is a uh, professor of psychology in the College of Arts and Sciences in the Department of International Studies. Uh, Dr. Mark teaches social psychology and cognitive psychology. His research internet areas covers also psychology of religion. Dr. Mark has a PhD in psychology from Florida State University, and he is a member of professional uh, 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 a member of professional organization, including the Midwestern Psychological Association and the American Psychological Association and the Association of Psychological Science. Um, thank you very much for uh, to Dr. Maher and Dr. Mark for joining me today, and um, let's go ahead. And I would like to let you know how the session will go. I'll begin by making a small introduction, okay? Probably like 10 minutes. And then I'll have some interview questions to both Dr. Maher and uh, Dr. Mark, and then we will receive audience uh, questions. So the first thing I would like to start with, I would like to start with an activity. Yeah. I would like um, to grab a piece of paper, 
or if you have a device in front of you, I would like to take that and think about something you are good at, something that you do well and you're proud of, just one thing. And that one thing is one of the things that um, help you be successful in your career. Go ahead, just one thing, okay? And tell me if you need, mo if you need more time. But if you need more time, then probably you are in a problem now. It's just like, it's just <laughs> one thing that makes you, makes you good at what you're doing. And um, I, I guess, I guess this is not too much to, to ask. And now, once, we, um, once you decided on that one thing, I would like to, to ask you a question. How did you become good at this? How did you become good at that one thing? Remember, this is an activity. Now, we, now this is the uh, time to go that to to go to that activity page. Uh, Bitly forward slash citl underscore Paul. Okay, go ahead and send your response. Okay, by communication. Go ahead. If you agree with communication, you can upvote it. Repetition and passion. <laughs> Come on. You have decided on one thing that you're good at, okay? How did you become good at it? All right, if you do not answer, I will go through the, um, I will go through the list of attendance and then I will go ahead and ask you by name, okay? You don't want me to do that. All right, experience practice. If you agree with experience practice, go ahead and upvote experience practice. You don't have really to type it. You'll have like two thumb, like one thumb up and one thumb down for each, for each one of them. And go ahead and upvote anything you agree with. Okay. I only see like five responses and I have more than 19 people on the, on here. All right. But I see, I see like, Good responses. You're communicating with the people. You're not afraid to fail. Probably you try out. Okay. Experience, practice. All right. Well, I think I, th I, I think this is good. Okay. I'm not going to uh, pressure you more on, on this. Study and practice. Okay. What we see here is we see that um, no one said by attending a lecture. Okay, what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna lock this before someone says attending a lecture. <laughs> All, right. All right, so, so yeah, like if we look at the lecture and look at the history of the architecture of learning space, um, we will see that the architecture of the learning space uh, started with the um, Greek amphitheater 3,000 years before, before Christ. It wasn't designed for learning. It wasn't designed for lecture. It was designed for, for performance. But fast forward to Renaissance, Renaissance period have embraced the amphitheater uh, for teaching. And then in the 19th century, we have this as the lecture hall, the 20th century, we still have the same shape of the lecture hall. But today, what do you think happened? Still have the same lecture hall, okay? But then what, what happens in the lecture? So I would like to, to also ask you what happens in a lecture, and for that, I will um, I will go ahead and ask you and show you a lecture, okay? And I would like to, to to ask you, without using learning or teaching or education, I would like you to use one word to describe that picture. 
You go ahead, the activity, um, I still, okay. I, I don't see discussion. I don't see communication. I don't see any interaction. Like, where did you get these from? Like, focus on the picture. Uh, someone says, sleep. Some, I'm sure someone is sleeping in that, in that crowd. One way, one way communication. Okay. Yeah, but but there's like where do you see discussion in in uh, this? There is projection, there's slides. Okay, it's teacher centered. Okay, uh, someone uh, like those people are listening. Okay, all right, good. So. I think what happens here is, but I didn't see like, there is one word that can describe what's happening here. And I believe that this word is, it's not there yet, did not come yet. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and lock this. Okay. I believe what's happening is process of information transmission from the lecturer to, to the student. There is just one way transmission of information. But, but is this education, like what happens now, is it ed education? Is education the process of transmission of information? If you agree, okay, I will give you a chance to agree with this or disagree. All right, so if you agree, this is your chance. If you disagree, this is also your chance. Okay, so is education the transfer of information? Go ahead. I would like to see how many, how many of you will say, yes, education is just the transfer of information. Okay, and what I did a mistake here, okay, uh, that I did not um, do the count on the responses. I did 100%, okay? So like 13% of you said, yes, education is just the transfer of information. Let's see if we can negate that. So according to you up until now, education has more in it than the transfer of, of, of information. All right, so, so I'm gonna go ahead and lock that now and move on. <clears throat> now, now that, that makes me think, okay? But I would like you to imagine that education is just that it's only the transfer of information. What is the logical thing to do to in education? If the education just the uh, uh, is just the process of transfer of of information, uh, I, I guess I guess the logical thing to to do is to let our students get information from sources like books videos, libraries, okay? Like the information is there. Uh, we don't need a human being to transmit the information. The information can be transmitted by other means. And then, <clears throat> and then we can do something else instead of lecturing. But what would we lose by replacing the lecture, by having students watching these lectures online? Can anyone tell me what will be lost? Go ahead, like you have access to the microphone. What would be lost if we replace lectures by having our students watching the lectures like on, on, on online? One word. I believe, I believe. I believe. Oh, go ahead, Miss Claire. Oh, yeah, go, go, go ahead, go ahead, Claire. All right. 
Um, I'm so sorry, first of all, for not being able to log into that link to participate. I've tried it twice, but anyway, don't worry. I would say maybe the students might feel they're not part of the university experience because that's what the traditional aspect is to be in a lecture hall and to be surrounded by students. Oh, they will be in a lecture hall. They will be surrounding in, in, uh, with, with the students, but we are re re replacing part of that experience or taking part of the lecture or the entire lecture, but they are in a, in a, in a classroom. But okay. what do you think, what do you think will happen if we take the lecture away from, from the classroom? Uh, that human touch of having the, the idea that the lecturer is in front of you because that's traditionally what they have been used to. All right. Uh, Maybe. All right, so they have been used to it or we have been used to it as instructors, okay? They're coming to us for like, like if they enter the classroom for the first time, they are coming to us. We have been used to lecturing. Actually, um, this is how we have been learning. Uh, and uh, when, we, um, when we receive a, uh, a course that we teach for the first time, I think most of us will, will ask this, will ask what I'm going to teach instead of asking how I'm going to teach it, okay? So how I'm going to teach it is the, the same way I've been taught it before in my, in my college. But I think is what everyone is uh, afraid of losing if they take the lecturing out of the classroom is the interaction. Is that cor correct? I think it's correct. I think this is, well, like, this is what you were trying to, to, to say, like interaction, okay? That's probably the students will eat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The interaction. But how no, much interaction the is there in the real stay. classroom? Yeah. <laughs> but look at your classroom. If you are doing lecturing, if you are doing lecturing the traditional way, like how much interaction is there in the real classroom? Is the interaction, is you asking the students if they have, if they are missing anything? If the interaction is uh, a student asking you to repeat? Is the interaction, is a student um, telling you that... Um, um, I do not understand this concept. No, I don't think so. I don't think this is this. Did you plan for this interaction? Like, did you plan for this interaction to happen? Do you have a list of questions that you will ask your students? I know a lot of you are doing that. Yes. Uh, Mr. Walid, may I add uh, one point, please? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So I would like to change the question to what would you gain by replacing lectures by having students watching the lecture online is the answer simply that as a teacher, I will gain more oh, time. That in the question classroom. is on the screen right now. Oh, okay. What would we gain by having our lectures posted online? Thank you very much. So can I answer? <laughs> oh, and the answers and the answers are here. How okay, like I, here? This yeah, is may I add question. one more thing is that uh, it will give an opportunity for the teacher to promote higher order thinking skills and focus on activities that promote higher order thinking skills. Higher and order skills, skills yeah. and reflection. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So let me, let me go back to that. Also, one more thing. Instead of interaction, I would say attraction. In the right. classroom, you can make your class more attractive, you know, and you can, you know, make the students more focused on the material than online. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Here, what we will gain by having our lectures posted online. Uh, don't worry, I'm not professing that we take all lecturing out, okay? Like later on, I, I will tell you that there are steps that you can take. You don't have to, uh, to, to do 100% uh, flipping of your classroom. You can do gradual flipping. You can do, uh, you can flip only part of, of your lecture, not all your, not all of your lecture, but think about this, okay? Um, if, we, if we have part of our lectures uh, posted on, online or, or we gave the opportunity uh, to our uh, students to watch these lectures online, they will have more opportunities to reflect. Have you ever had this request in your classroom? As students will go ahead and raise their hand and tell you, Professor, can you be quiet for five minutes? I need to think. Do you have this? Or, uh, uh, Professor, can you repeat the last 10 or 15 minutes? Because I would like to hear them again. I don't think. I don't think that uh, like any of you had this 
in the classroom. And, uh, and I don't think that the classroom, uh, when you are lecturing, okay, students, um, they have little opportunities for learning because there is a lot of pressure at, at the moment for the students to grasp on what's being said. Students will go, you are lecturing in the front of the classroom. The transformation process is happening. What the students know that they need this transmission to go into their heads, but it's so much going on that uh, at the pressure of that time, they don't have time to reflect. What they are trying to do is to grab their notes and they're trying to, to take whatever you're telling them into their notes and later on, learning will happen outside of the classroom. And a lot of students, uh, when we give them the opportunity to have the lecture posted online, they have time to reflect, they have time to repeat, they have time to consult with their peers. And this is a, um, a, like a concept called peer instruction. Um, there is a professor in Harvard University called Eric Ma Mazur from, from the 90s. He had been professing peer, in, peer instruction. Um, he has a really good um, manual for peer instruction. I will, um, um, I, I just did not plan to, 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 to mention him in this presentation. But I can send you like um, like when you uh, when when our guests are answering questions, I'll go ahead and um, give you um, links to his work. Uh, and um, with the with Eric Mazur, he note like he saw that his students are really good in solving like answering uh, problem solving questions, but um, they are not good at all in answering conceptual. Uh, questions. He's a professor of physics, okay, and he did an extensive research on the ways people are lecturing, and then he came to the conclusion, I would like those students, okay, to have time in the classroom to learn. I don't, I want this, the learning to happen inside the classroom, not outside of the, of, of the classroom, and they learn better uh, uh, by discussion through themselves, even in the physics class, in an engineering class, in a problem solving class. So this is not only for one type or one discipline. You can do this across disciplines. So I would like to stop here and ask you, what is ed 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 education? Okay. And I'm just because I'm, I have no assistant with me, I'm doing this. Okay, so what is education? Go ahead now and tell me what is education. Also, this, is, this can be upvote. You don't have to type if you see something in the list that you agree with. Education is teaching and learning, which is, this is the process, okay. Sharing knowledge. Okay. Um, what I guess, I guess education has two parts. It has a part where knowledge is being transferred, but also the ability to transfer this knowledge to a new context. So unless students take what they learned in one context, and we're able to apply it to a new context, you haven't really learned anything. So we know that in the 20th century, robots have replaced um, assembly line jobs. And we know that in, the, in this century, computers will replace any job, any job that uh, will require um, information retrieval or will require procedural problem solving. 
And we actually need to prepare our students for, for, uh, for, for this. They will be easily re, re, uh, replaced. So if lecturing is dominant, two things will happen. There will be lack of learning. There is research on, on this. And there will be lack of retention. There's also research for this. Uh, uh, so yes, yes, like you can have students who are excellent in solving, uh, in, um, in answering problem solving questions and acing your, um, your final exam, but you uh, test them on the concept, they won't be able to. So this is lack of, lack of learning and there will be lack of retention. Uh, most, most of our uh, students will um, will go back to where they were two months after they finished a specific course, okay? Um, there was this comedian uh, probably in the early 90s who had a plan for the five minutes university. Five minutes. We only need five minutes to get to give someone a, um, um, a bachelor de de degree. If if all of our students will only remember five minutes of their instruction, then we give them uh, like we give them that in five minutes uh, and let them go. All they need to 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 know uh, after they leave college, uh, I'm sorry, all they remember after they need they, they, they leave college is just five minutes of what they attended in in, uh, in college. So, and, and Skinner, B.F. Skinner, um, he's a uh, psychologist that says that he said that it has been said that education is what survives when a man has forgotten all he has been taught. Um, so we would like to maximize that. We would like to maximize on uh, that, that education. Forgetting will happen. People will for will will forget, but with the that the attitudes and the, and the skills will remain. This is this is what education is. It's assimilation of uh, of information. But unfortunately, this happens outside of the classroom. The transfer of information happens inside the classroom. We would like to flip that. So this is the flipped classroom. So what we do in, in a class, if not lecturing. So if we're not lecturing, we question. We post questions to our students. Students already watched the lecture or read the, or did the, the reading. Now we question them. We give them opportunities to think before they answer the question. So we poll them on the question. We pair them or we give them a discussion or an activity where they go and work with their peers and then we re-poll them again on the same question. We see the difference between the first poll and the second poll and then we do an explanation. And that's the flipped classroom. The benefits, we're gonna give the student engaged. We can give them time for reflection. Uh, we're gonna give students control over the pace of the lecture. Um, we will make more advanced students uh, not bored, okay? They can go ahead through the lecture quickly than other students. We're gonna free up class time for activities. We're gonna have room for peer instruction, powerful tool. We can reuse content that we developed. We will have opportunities for formative evaluation. When we do this, we will know what's working, what's not working. We can adjust our instruction accordingly. We're going to increase teacher student interactions in the classroom. Claire, I saw like this is this will increase uh, the interaction between you and and your students. And I'm and I'm sure there are there are a lot of these things happening already in most of our classrooms. So. Some evidence, okay, 
So these are some evidence that I can actually forward it to you. I'm not going to go ahead and, and, and read through them. This is a school that dropped the filler rate 50%. This is a survey of 452 students who said that their test scores have been improved. Their student um, attitude toward learning has also been um, uh, improved. University of British Columbia, okay, they said they, they saw that uh, scores of, um, of students who attended a flipped classroom were better than scores of those who attended a uh, regular lecture classroom. And here in San Jose State University, midterm grades were 11% higher than, uh, than those of those students who attended a regular lecture. And this is the sequence that you need to do if you would like to uh, flip your classroom. Um, you record your lecture and introduce it. Introduce it to your, to your students and make it available. Students will attend that recorded lecture and I made attend between parentheses, okay? Because there are ways to make sure that your, that your students watch the video, okay? And interacted with it somehow. Uh, and then you go ahead and assess your, uh, students on uh, understanding and the students engage in classroom learning uh, activity. These are the potential challenges. The challenges. It might take time. You might be really skeptic about content coverage. You might think that this is not suitable for large classrooms. My students will not watch the lecture. Some students will resist that. And I'm sure our guests, okay, have, have more to tell us about the potential challenges. All right. So what I'm going to do now I would like to start with uh, Dr. Mark, okay? Dr. Mark, can, can you tell us what inspired you to, um, to do this? What I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And Dr. Mark, if you're listening to me, I would like to, 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 to tell me what actually inspired you to to flip your classroom, if you ever actually started flipping your classroom? Yeah, I've tried it in a, in a couple of different classes. I think what inspired me was fear. Um, when I when you have a model of education that is um, built on information delivery, like showing up to the class and um, going through slides and just talking and lecturing, um, and then you start to see new technologies emerging that make the delivery of uh, information by video extremely easy and cost efficient. Uh, you start to um, wonder what the future of education is going to look like. And I started to realize that um, there, there may come a day when it's very easy to replace um, many of the professors in the classroom with videos kind of in the, in the way that you uh, <laughs> outlined earlier or maybe implied earlier. And, um, and so uh, part of it, um, you know, was um, just a, a desire to um, take advantage of the technologies that we have and then um, make better use of the classroom time. Uh, because I think that, you know, we may be heading towards a future in which that kind of information delivery gets outsourced um, to very good content that is much cheaper to deliver than hiring. Um, faculty to stand in front of a classroom and do the thing that technology that videos uh, can do um, much more cheaply. Um, that may be a ways down the road. There was a time when the massively open online course movement MOOCs uh, were, you know, everybody was excited about those and predicting that this was the kind of the wave of the future. And we've seen some of the limitations of that as well. I think um, what I'm always interested in when I when I hear about ideas like this, and I heard about flipped classrooms probably about seven, eight years ago, started reading about them, is um, looking at the evidence for their effectiveness. So going into the literature, and in particular, looking at meta-analyses, um, researchers who publish, this, these are um, research studies where researchers analyze a bunch of different research studies that have been conducted um, on the flipped classroom model or some other teaching technique. And then they pool all those results together and try to come up with a general uh, conclusion based on those, um, um, based on that data. And um, when I 
first started playing around with this, there really wasn't much available because not many people were doing this, at least under this name, to the point where they were actually testing it in, in studies. And more recently, just in the last three or four years, there have been a bunch of meta-analyses that have come out on the flipped classroom model. And most of the results are fairly positive, but you do see some negative results. And uh, the general lesson that seems to come out of this literature is that it really depends on how you're implementing it yeah, and, in what con and in what context you're implementing it. One of the major complaints from the student perspective is increased workload. So faculty are, you know, they're doing a lot of the traditional stuff like assigning textbooks to read. That's giving all my just, questions now. Okay. Because this yeah. is a separate question. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Actually, sorry. I was, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, but um, but here, like um, you said that um, um, that that the students have um, said this is a lot of work, right? Yeah, and it's what comes out. And uh, this was my experience at AUS. Like this was the major complaint. Like it was a lot of work to do before class. And then the other complaint was that um, that I would assess their knowledge as well to make sure, uh, as you indicated previously, in those in and some of those models you showed in your slides, I would assess, the, uh, assess their preparation for the class because if they don't actually do that work ahead of time, the class period, you do not, um, the, the, they are just lost during the class period. So you have to have very um, strong accountability mechanisms to make sure that you can take advantage of that kind of active learning, interaction, discussion, application, all these things that you want to do in the classroom with the flipped classroom model. But if they're not coming, coming to class prepared, then, um, then, you're, then it's not going to work. And because the typical model of the classroom for many of them is you come, you, they come in, they sit passively, listen to a lecture, and they, they can be very resistant, even if it is effective. And that's what you see in this literature, that there isn't a close correspondence between the learning outcomes in terms of actual knowledge gained and the student perception of the process. And I don't know if Maher's experienced that or if he's got some like techniques and other things he's been able to do to kind of like shift those perceptions of students, but I've really kind of struggled to- well, What would you do to, to make sure that your students are actually attending the lecture outside the classroom? So I was posting them on Panopto. So I have a record of their, um, whether they're actually watching it. And I, and so that's one thing. And then, um, Typically, we would I would give them quizzes either um, before class on iLearn or they would actually come to class and they, we would start out with a very brief quiz um, that would try to hold them accountable. But as you can imagine, this is not a super popular <laughs> approach, even if it is effective. So I think part of the challenge here is making this approach um, a little more enjoyable for students. And um, even though it's some, in some ways um, not only challenging, but um, goes against their expectations for what a classroom should be like. Do you think it, um, if you, um, uh, if you give us an advice on developing content for flipped classroom, what advice would you give us? Um, make it short. Uh, this is the number one thing that I think came out of the literature that I was reading. And I wish I'd kind of had that literature when I first started it out, but you just be careful about how much you ask for them. Um, outside of class, I guess this would be the number one thing. Um, yeah, but I don't know, maybe some other people have some suggestions too who, who've tried this model. All right, excellent. And um, Mark, the final question is like, what tools do you use? Like rather than like, I know that you're using not to, to publish and for, for analytics data of who attended, but do you use other tools for recording your lectures? I mean, I, I don't know what you mean by tools. Um, for recording the lectures, I use this software called Camtasia. So it's just okay. a, a record of a lecture, you know, uh, where I'm doing a voiceover. You can also do a video of yourself um, along with that. Um, but I, I admit I haven't been super creative about what they're doing, what they were doing outside the class, aside from doing the reading and listening to the lecture or, or watching the lecture. Typically in the lecture, I would try to add something beyond what they had in an assigned reading. And maybe one of the mistakes is having like both of these formats and it's too much of a workload. Um, yeah, I don't know. But um, one of the things that I, I, I did then the last time I used this approach is I, I gave students a um, survey about this methodology and really tried to pinpoint what were the kind of um, 
what were the what were they thinking about this methodology not because it's necessarily the the sole criteria i'm going to use you know in terms of revising it or using it but i think it is important to get that feedback so the only other tool that i would mention is just um actually surveying your students on it and getting feedback from them thank you very much thank you we'll, uh, we'll get back to you mark when we open up the floor for questions but now i would like to give the floor to uh dr maher Bahul, and i understand that uh, dr maher you have a lot of things that you need to um, to tell us. Um, um, you asked for some time for uh, like some slides and some activities, and I'm really cannot wait to see what you are, um, what you have for uh, us. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Walid, very much. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I think what I would like to share with you uh, is pretty much an activity with, which I think every single teacher. Uh, primary, secondary, college uh, can do. Uh, it is simply based on a number of, um, of aspects uh, through which, uh, as you see, uh, one through five. The first, uh, there is a reading of the chapter by the students and they read it ahead of time. Uh, and then they post comprehension questions or analytical questions, but they post questions ahead of time. And uh, there is a process through which uh, uh, class will address the questions that they had posted. And the students also will react to the, um, you know, to the questions they, they, which got answered in class. Uh, the whole process is pretty much peer to peer and they take turns. And the teacher is pretty much a facilitator of this whole activity. Okay, so this is one activity which I think can be uh, implemented, can be done across the board. Right. So uh, in my classes, this is done within a particular, uh, let's say, with every single chapter, uh, which eventually involves um, a presentation. But before the presentation, let's say the presentation is on Sunday. So Wednesday uh, before Sunday, the questions of that particular chapter get posted. Then whoever is presenting me or the students, we pick up all the questions by all the students. We select the questions. We address them during the, the lecture time. And I will show you how to make it enjoyable, interesting, and you introduce some variation and uh, social media uh, as well. So the students who ask questions will get a chance to also react to the, you know, to the answers that are, uh, that are provided. And uh, there will be an interaction between those who ask the question and those who answer the question and those who replied and so on and so forth. Right now. So th this is in general the activity that uh, I have kind of been uh, managing. So the activity is designed through a platform called slido.com. This particular website provides you uh, with the, uh, an opportunity to uh, create an event. So as you see, the, key, the event is, is titled uh, questions on chapter 10 for these two students. These two students are going to present chapter 10, but the questions will be, uh, 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 will be uh, submitted by each student as, as you see here, for example, um, a student uh, Inara posted uh, four questions. Um, and as I said, this is ahead of time. Uh, Sarah posted uh, also four questions to the students. Um, so the, uh, let me go, go back to, to this. So the questions are pretty much posted ahead of time. And uh, when you have 20 students and each one posts four, so you end up with 80 questions. So whoever is presenting has to deal with 80 questions. So I usually tell them at least select one question, uh, you know, for, from each student. So this way there will be at least 20 uh, questions that are going to be answered. And of course, in the guidelines, the questions of course should not be repetitive and each question uh, relates to a particular aspect of, uh, of uh, the, the learning objectives uh, of that particular chapter. Right. Um, 
And this has been uh, quite successful. Now, just to tell you a little bit how the pre presentation of the chapter is, uh, is done. Uh, I tell students to prepare a presentation, but to present it, not like teachers do. Uh, and then I tell them, select any item, any tool you, you pretty much identify or like in the entertainment industry. Uh, so the field of edutainment, I have been pretty much promoting this field, including uh, uh, mixing, you know, education with entertainment is uh, pretty much a, a desirable uh, methodology. So, for example, some students will uh, choose a podcast and in that particular podcast. So they have the questions submitted, uh, you know, uh, by the students and in the podcast, they address you know, those questions and they address, of course, the, by the students by name. Now, so we receive a question uh, by, uh, you know, Sarah and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, in usually uh, the uh, project of the presentation, there is a specific moment where there is a Q&A session. Okay. And the Q&A session uh, could be done in different ways. Um, now in the online, with the online and with this particular activity, the questions have already been posted. So then the presenters, either me or the students who are presenting, then we take the questions and then we say, Sarah asked this question and this is the answer to the question. So you can see a sample of sharing the question and you can see that the, the student who uh, asked that particular question is shared with them. So sometimes I ask the student, uh, I post the, the question and then I tell the students, can you read your question? So this way he's in class or she's in class and they are also reading that question, you know, bringing them closer to, uh, to, to, to you know, to the dynamics of, uh, of the classroom. Now, uh, uh, you would like to also, uh, you know, get students closer to social media and wh what's going on nowadays, because nowadays questions could be sent through different media. So even though, they all send the questions, you know, through Slido. But then when you introduce the questions, you can say this is a WhatsApp, you know, message. Uh, and you put it in, 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 the, in, the, in a WhatsApp format. And uh, uh, if that particular tool also includes likes, then you can say that this question also received, you know, 10,000, 100,000 likes and so on and so forth, right? So the same go goes with the, the tweets also. Uh, some questions are put also through tweets and uh, some others, uh, um, uh, some others, uh, some other work you can do once you receive questions. You have, for example, you know, uh, eight uh, male students, uh, 12 female students. So you can do a little bit of uh, stats to show, you know, what types of questions there is a tendency for young ladies to ask, for gents to ask, and so on and so forth. So it becomes data, and then you can do a number of interesting things with it, right? Now, uh, Slido also gives you the idea, it gives you a little bit, like you can see a word cloud. What are the most common kind of uh, words, the main topics that students brought up? And then it gives you the most influential participants, those who ask most, more questions, and so on and so forth, right? So this is also something you, you work with. Um, most popular questions. Uh, uh, now, when also we do uh, some sort of a Kahoot quiz, some of those questions will be also in the quiz. So you, you tell them, watch out, some of your questions might be in incorporated in the quiz. So for students, uh, the, uh, the q and or the questions that they uh, submit ahead of time, they know that they are going to be used, you know, at least in two or three different ways in class. Uh, one of them in the uh, how, you know, you bring them up. Uh, the second one in probably the, uh, the quiz. And they know that social media uh, will be also involved. Uh, sometimes uh, you, you know, you act as if someone made a phone call and asked the question if it is, uh, let's say, uh, a radio show or, or TV show. Uh, uh, you use questions coming through Facebook, uh, questions uh, through website, questions through Instagram, uh, et cetera, and so on and so forth. So all of these have been kind of uh, used uh, by students and, uh, and, and uh, uh, enjoyed uh, most of the time. Uh, now, uh, 
the uh, the Q and A and the medium, which is pretty much TV show, podcast, uh, um, radio show, and so on and so forth. All of these, I think, they kind of complement each other. Uh, they go hand in hand because you're 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 introducing something new, but at the same time. Uh, you're complementing it with something that is um, fun, that is creative, and uh, students uh, end up really acting these uh, presentations. So you can see we can flip without really, you know, uh, um, just through the Q and A. Uh, so many, you know, uh, I mean, recording a lecture. What, what Mark had done, of course, is 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 excellent. Uh, my uh, kind of reservations uh, uh, with recording lectures is that uh, oh, there are so many things. I, I remember once my, my son came and told me, Daddy, we don't want to listen to this teacher because she does not have a teaching voice. I mean, I told him I've been teaching for more than 30 years. I never thought of a teaching voice, but this <laughs> this this could be this could be a good uh, a good uh, uh, you know a concept to explore. Are all voices teaching voices? Which voice is going to appeal to the students? Did we think about it? Well, you know um, yeah, you yeah, can absolutely. see you can see this particular one is pretty much peer to peer, students to students. And uh, they are doing everything, but you are facilitating all of this. You are managing all of this. You are setting up the, uh, the tools. You are uh, assigning the tasks. You are making sure that you know, all will, will go well. And uh, I'll, I'll stop here uh, for the for Yeah, the it's really funny that you brought up this voice thing, okay? Because um, when, we, uh, when, we, when we help instructors create their own videos, okay, we actually focus on the audio quality. The audio quality is one of the, uh, the determining factors if the students will go and continue listening to the, to the recorded lecture or just, um, or struggle with it or... Um, completely, completely just dis disregarded. Uh, uh, during your, your, your presentation, you came across multiple tools, okay? Would you, would you care to forward us a list of the tools that you are uh, using um, in your instruction sure. and the uh, use case for each one, okay? Sure. And then we'll be able to, uh, like, um, to include these tools in any of our upcoming sessions uh, like so, tutorial. Sure, Walid, I'll, I'll be happy also, of course, yeah. to correspond with any colleague and uh, should, Absolutely. They right. need, should they need more elaboration. I know it's five minutes, but when Walid told me about this, I told him the last monograph talks about learning spaces and how to uh, turn yeah. students into a creative, uh, you know, individuals. And it's a monograph that has 80 pages that focuses on this particular, you know, pedagogical tool. But um, I think five minutes gives a little bit of aspects and traits to this yeah all right excellent so um um before i go ahead and tell uh, like if you have any questions okay i wish that we had more more people from from stem education people who are teaching science uh or engineering or math uh or like com computers any any people from from stem because this is actually coming from like the, the the concept of flipping the the uh, the uh, classroom um, is coming from STEM education. One of them, the the major projects uh, that inspired uh, teachers um, uh, around the world to flip their classrooms is Khan Academy. And Khan Academy started as a a, a like some guy trying to help his uh, niece or nephew. I do not remember by recording. Uh, by recording uh, like math concepts. And then people started looking at it on YouTube and he made Khan Academy. Um, uh, Professor Eric Mazur that I really like, like, like I uh, posted um, on the chat a um, video lecture of him, Confessions of a Converted Lecture. Okay. Uh, professor Eric Mazur is, um, is a professor of uh, physics. So it's coming from STEM education. He also created that uh, peer instruction manual, 
which is um, something that uh, uh, also inspired me during this, um, um, this presentation also coming like this is a physics uh, uh, professor. So my point is, is like flipping the classroom is, um, is not something that is good for one discipline and not good for the others. Flipping the, the classroom and I, with, with research that I showed is, is something that goes across disciplines. So let me know if you have any questions now. We still have Dr. Maher Bahrur and Dr. Mark with us. If you have any questions for them, if you have any questions for, for, for me, if you have a point of discussion to, uh, to uh, raise, please go ahead. Walid, if I may. Um, yeah, probably. Just one observation. I, I see one of my students attending because I forwarded the link to her. But I think, I think really, in addition to the faculty uh, coming to these events, the students will be a major, a major contributor to them. I agree. <laughs> because we're talking about them and they're absent. <laughs> I agree with that. Uh, uh, Dr. Nurita, you have something to say? Go ahead. Um, yes. Thank you, Maha. Thank you, Mark. It's really, really useful. I'm, I'm very happy um, to hear about all the different tips that you guys shared. So I have a specific question for Maha, especially because it seems like the method that you're using in the classroom work very, very well. Um, did you actually spend, I don't know, a few minutes of your time in the beginning of the semester to talk about the expectation and to talk about the method that you're going to be using in the classroom? Um, uh, let me let me explain one thing, uh, um, because this this flip methodology is coupled also with the uh, talk show format of the presentations. I, I after I split the, the, the class into groups, I meet with each group and talk to each group separately because I don't want them all to hear the exact same things. And then I tell them because this is a creative activity, uh, I want you to do it uh, like for yourselves, by yourself, don't even tell me, don't even, uh, let's, let it be a surprise the day of the presentation. Um, but in terms of uh, the flipped and the Q&A, uh, that's posted for everyone. So they all know that they have to read the chapter ahead of time and post questions. And I, I really, I, I have a student of mine here. I would love that she talks a little bit about her experience with, this, with the flip methodology. <laughs> if possible, uh, <laughs> That would be great, Maha. Yeah, please. Hazard, if, if you would like Thank to do you. so, go ahead. Hi, everyone. It's so good to see a lot of familiar faces. Hi, Hazard. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Go ahead. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, I have to say that it was really, in the beginning, the first class you attend, you're usually going through the syllabus, just um, knowing what chapters you're going to go through and all, but we were very surprised in Dr. Maher's class that it's a whole different format and we're not going to be lectured. We will lecture each other. And it was a bit frustrating in the beginning, trying to get accommodated to this new concept. But um, Dr. Maher has provided us with a lot of support, of help. You get to meet with him before your presentation. You discuss your ideas and then you just present it and you get feedback from everyone, from your classmates, and you get to address that feedback. And to be honest, that has taught me a lot beyond the course itself. You learn to accept feedback, to get it, to deal with it, and, and also communicate your own ideas and, and thoughts behind a certain, um, uh, a certain decision that you've made. So that too. And surprisingly enough, I also took a course with Dr. Mark, so I had the chance to experience experience his own methodology and they're very different but to be honest it's it's very um liberating to be to be very specific um i've learned a lot from these two courses more than I, tens of other courses that i've attended and it's it's more it's beyond the course itself it's beyond the material it's something that you learn that you apply every day in your life and i'm very grateful to these two professors to be honest Thank you very much, Hajar. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really sur not, sur not surprised to hear that, but I, I can connect this to, um, to a professor um, who was, he also flipped the classroom. 
Um, I'm very bad with names and memory, but um, when you said that, uh, oh, we are not going to receive lectures, but we are going to be lecturing ourselves, okay, that professor received negative feedback on their um, on his uh, end of semester student evaluations where um, one student said, oh, this professor did not teach us anything. We did all the work, okay? And although that this feedback was something that looks on the surface as negative, but uh, it was positive in a way that um, actually this is, um, um, some might argue this is actually the, um, um, the message of the instruction, the instructor. The instructor is, to, is, is not responsible for spoon feeding information or spoon feeding the subject, but um, giving more opportunities for students uh, to be able to learn. Okay, and that instructor was successful in doing that. Norita, I have something to say. I don't know if Norita can hear us, but your uh, microphone is muted. If you're trying to say something uh, or you did not um, uh, lower your you hand. you ask me a question, Walid? I'm sorry. Oh, no, just your hand is uh, still up there. And I thought oh, that- Okay, uh, no, 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 I'm, I'm good. No, no, no issues. Thank you very much, Hajar. Um, that was really uh, uh, valuable to the content of, uh, of this uh, se uh, uh, session. Um, we are now past five o'clock and um, if you would still hang around here and have some questions, I do not mind. Um, uh, but um, thank you very much for attending. All right. And um, um, if you would like to leave now, like we, um, um, we were happy to have you. If you would like to stay more and um, have questions for Dr. Maher or Dr. Mark, uh, please do so. Um, as you, um, uh, as a conclusion, uh, please, like if you're interested in flipping your classroom, if you need help, um, come to CITL, okay? Uh, we will be able to, um, to help you start the conversation with people who already did it. Uh, we will be able to give you logistical su support like uh, um, tools that you would like, to, like we will go ahead and discuss tools with you, the tools that you would like to use to flip the classrooms, tools um, that will make you uh, record uh, lectures, better lectures, um, make your lecture recording uh, a little bit interactive, like you can do an interactive lecture and allow your students to, um, uh, to, to interact with the lecture uh, while you're not there, like it will interact with you in a video. You can include um, uh, some quizzes in the lecture as well, and all these information can be, uh, can, can feed back to the LMS. Watch out for one of our upcoming um, uh, technical sessions where we're going to go ahead and show you how to record a uh, video lecture, an interactive le video lectures, a vi video lecture with quizzes and uh, how you can um, retrieve um, access and interaction information from these video lectures. Thank you very much for coming and uh, looking forward to see, to see you again uh, in upcoming e e events. Thank you very much. Yeah, Walid, if, if I may add something, because... Uh, of course, I'm oh, still here. Yeah, Hajar, Hajar um, you know, uh, spoke about... Um, because we're talking about maximizing interaction, uh, whether offline or online. Uh, the idea of uh, when uh, you have a creative presentation, you would really like to take advantage of that and have all students comment on areas of success and areas of improvement. And when that is done, it's also a very good idea to give a chance to the presenters to react to the feedback. Awesome. So this is the item that Hazard was kind of commenting on because it, you know, it's, it's for the first time, students had a chance to react to the comments of their peers. And it was in, in a form of a presentation where they highlighted, thank you so much, these are the areas of success and thank you for the advice. These are the areas of improvements. We will take them into consideration in our next presentations. And then you can see that it's a cycle. You know, students post questions, presenters address the questions. And then the students, the audience provide feedback. And then the presenters react to the feedback. So it's pretty much like a circle of communication that kind of gets completed. 
and it's it's an experience for for students like for the first time most of them said we never had you know to really react to any feedback we never got any feedback from all the students <laughs> the feedback is all is only given by the by the teachers the instructor, but yeah. when you give when you empower the students you give them the floor you tell them now highlight areas of success and areas of improvement uh, steer them away from anything negative anything positive no you know everyone uh, Everyone should maybe, you know, improve in one way or another. And we all need to improve in one way or another. So no one is perfect. So with that in mind, you know, highlighting areas of success and areas of improvement becomes an activity that is desirable overall. And when they see the reaction, they can see that, wow, you know, and, and Hazar and her uh, partner, they, they were the first to present. I remember they, 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 had, they received a lot of heat and they said, Oh, because we're first. <laughs> but Hazard is one of the best students I've ever had. Uh, you know, she's, uh, as you can well, see. Well, we are lucky that we have, like, um, the best students in the country. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I, I, can, I can go on and talk about this for a long time, okay? Like, one of the things that's really, that, 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 uh, um, that, that made me like this very much is, how much um, like responsibility the students will take into their hands and um, how much they will feel in control. And one of the, and, and that will affect the way students uh, probably perceive learning at AUS and how much, how much AUS is investing in um, making sure that our students will come out with a, um, with the tools they need to face out the world, like a lot of confidence, for example, are needed from our students to go ahead and uh, um, face the job market out, out there, uh, face the challenges of, um, uh, of, a, of a new graduate. So these instructional methodologies, uh, when we instate them in our curriculum, in our course design, um, we give our students an, like a great opportunity to to tackle things after after graduation. All right, thank you very much. Um, we're still here. If you have any questions to tell us, if you'd like to take the mic, go ahead and take it. Um, otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you, and see you soon. I just I just have a quick comment. I mean, people can just leave <laughs> if you want to leave. I just, I just want to see. I just want to add a little bit about the. Uh, what Maha just said about getting ongoing feedback, because this is one of the best way, I guess, um, to get or to be using alternative feedback mechanism in the classroom. So it's not only helping us, it's also helping the student as well. So um, I'm very happy that you brought it up. So one of the next session that we're going to have that we're planning is definitely the alternative feedback mechanism. So maybe you can join in later um, again, Maha, to help us with the session. It's really, really exciting. Thank you so much for, for, for yeah. helping for helping us today and definitely being here. So thanks, Mark. Right. Thanks, Mark. Please go ahead and hop on the mic. You raised your hand. And please do not, um, do not feel that I'm trying to end the session. I'm not trying to end the session. Okay. Go, go, go ahead, Mice. Okay, hi. I just realized that my mic was on and I have no, my daughter no. down and I was chatting to her, so excuse me for that. Um, uh, a question to Dr. Maher. Um, um, it's very interesting what you're doing in the class. I'm just wondering, is this like a weekly activity or uh, once per chapter? And then um, each group will be covering a different chapter. So like you have two students covering chapter one, another two students covering chapter two, and so on. So it's like one presentation per chapter, which happens maybe every two weeks or every three weeks. Could, could you just give a, a hint um, to a, a timeline, like in the semester, how many of these presentations would you have? So yeah. I'm, I'm sure you still have the traditional um, uh, lecture so you, you do do that, but in addition to it, you, you also flip the classroom, right? Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, in fact, uh, yeah, Mace, uh, thank you. This is correct because uh, when we meet three times a week, so there is one time a week, it's the students that prepare and the students that reflect, and it's from students to students. I tell them, you have 30% of the curriculum. <laughs> You're in charge of it. Now, when I put them in uh, pairs of two, 
then you know there are like 10 groups so out of the 15 weeks they present 10 uh, for 10 weeks so they present 10 times but it, it happened at times where uh, some students wanted to do it again so I stretched and then I had like 14 presentations uh, in the semester. Uh, but I think the best is, for have, is, is to have maybe one every other week. Uh, this is something I'm doing this semester because uh, students thought it was quite, quite heavy for a general education course. <laughs> because, you know, you know, in class with these general education courses. So they tell you this is a lot because you know, uh, preparing ahead of time. And then I also have them take notes and then upload the notes. So there, if it's a writing course, like English 204, in addition to the notes, they have to write summary paragraphs so to improve their, uh, you know, uh, writing and, and coherence and so on and so forth. So it can get a little bit uh, demanding and, uh, and, uh, and hard, uh, but you, you, if, if you assign the presentation to a group of three, then you have seven maximum per semester, which is one uh, every other week. So it's really, it really depends between one uh, every other week to once a week. You know, uh, this is how ha I have experimented with both of them. Uh, right. uh, so they do 30%. I take uh, the remaining 70% uh, in the other two lectures with reinforcing activities of the chapter and uh, extensions and so on and so forth. Yeah. I hope I answered your question, Mace. All right. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. All right. One thing that um, we will gain by um, going back to campus is that um, we don't have to end the session like physically go ahead and click a button to end the session and then everyone's connection with everyone else immediately ends. There will be a door to a room and people can hang out after that. I wish we can do this here. But uh, again, like for the probably for the fourth time, thank you very much for being with us today and hope to see you soon. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording now. Hey, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.